thank you for inviting me here. The careers of newsmakers either end in failure, rehab or prison, sometimes all three. Whereas the careers of those who report the news are likely to end in, well, failure, rehab or prison. <laughs> Barely a day goes by when we don't hear of another celebrity, journalist or politician being hauled off for a police investigation. Whether it's Talisa and drugs, Rebecca Brooks and phone hacking, or the Deputy Commons Speaker Nigel Evans and rape claims, one or other of us is always heading off for the clink. But I'm going to argue that we journalists have much more of a party before the party's over. At least we don't always have to be watching our backs for pesky journalists. I've never actually done any debating before, so I took a bit of advice before coming here um, and spoke to a few MPs who've done it before. And one of them said, whatever you do, don't try and busk it. And I had to laugh when my co-speaker Mark Easton, quite unaware of that conversation, suggested on Twitter that he and I should just busk it. Because <laughs> after all, that's what we do all the time in the day job. <clears throat> of course, even the highest profile journalists busk it quite a lot of the time. But then so do the newsmakers. The other guy who was supposed to be proposing the motion tonight, somebody called Rylan Clark, took busking it to a whole new level. He didn't even bother turning up. And politicians make it quite an art form. Earlier this week, I was having dinner with a cabinet minister, and we were talking about a key measure in the Mark March budget. And he'd been asked a pretty basic question about this measure in the House of Commons debating chamber, and didn't have a clue how to answer. It turned out neither did the Chancellor, who was sitting next to him. No one had even thought about it. Even the Prime Minister busks it. A few weeks ago, he suddenly announced in Prime Minister's questions that the government was going to legislate to force electricity companies to put everybody on the lowest tariff. There were bemused and shocked expressions on his front benches. It was the first the rest of the Cabinet have heard of this policy. Within minutes, Downing Street realised that such a move would be completely illegal, and it was left to Number 10 aides and the Department for Energy to cook up some kind of alternative policy that saved the Prime Minister's blushes. The joy of being a journalist, of course, is that you have a much better chance of getting away with busking it. So what's this motion really about? I can't help feeling that so far the contributions have been a little bit half of the argument. The entire focus has been on why journalists are bad or whether they are good or bad, rather than whether it's actually better to make the news. And if you look at the motion, it is calling for a comparison. Is it better to be one or the other? So I think you have to start by asking who actually makes the news? And the answer to that is celebrities, like Michael, criminals, victims, royals, ordinary people who find themselves in extraordinary circumstances, eminent academics and exceptionally successful business figures. That pretty much covers it. Now, I doubt many of you really aspire to become TV entertainers or pop stars. And so I'm just going to focus on why it's better to be a journalist than it is to be a politician. Because I suspect some people in the audience are interested in one day entering Parliament. Perhaps they dream of making it to the Cabinet or um, you know, running great ministerial office. And so for those people, I'd just like to bring you some real home truths about what it's like to be a politician. I spend every day working with politicians. I see it up front. And it really, frankly, amazes me that anyone would want to do the job. First of all, you've got the utter misery of getting to Westminster in the first place, the trudging round the arse end of nowhere with your leaflets, knocking on doors, being told to F off by everybody, trying to persuade people to vote for you. You're never really in control of what happens. It all may turn on a dime. And finally, sure. I'm afraid that you're preaching to the converted there. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. 
And finally, when you get there, what's it like? Well, you don't even have a desk. Most new MPs are hot desking. And so far from being in the corridors of power, at Westminster, you spend most of your time doing what you're told and fielding endless constituency work, which is generally about housing, immigration and benefits. And you're usually in some awful room in a library in some horrendous part of the country. And all of this for the princely sum of 65 grand a year. And believe me, no chance of a pay rise. Almost everybody at Westminster believes MPs are woefully underpaid relative to the responsibilities they have. But really, which political leader is going to argue for a big raise? And then to stand any chance of promotion as a newly elected MP, you're going to have to continually set aside your conscience and disengage your brain. You have to be hideously obsequious, march robot-like through the expected voting lobby, and even if you do all of that, you can't necessarily be sure of being promoted. After all, who knows if and when there'll be a reshuffle, who knows who'll be in charge of handing out the jobs, and what if the whip or the minister that you've shamelessly cultivated has been sacked or has to resign. It's all in the lap of the gods. In fact, your chances of getting into the cabinet are about as high as the chances of a single sperm fertilising an egg and becoming a person. And trying to beat the odds in politics is a lot less fun than it is trying to beat the odds in fertilisation. <laughs> so, Let's just say you pull it off and you make it to the cabinet. Then you really are in a position to make news, or, or are you? <laughs> well, sadly, not really. I mean, you might think that prime minister or cabinet ministers are the ultimate newsmakers. But actually, when, if and when you ever get there, you find that all you can really do is tinker with a few things. You're constantly bumping up against the EU or the civil service or the unions or the voters all of whom pretty much conspire to make sure that you can't do anything much else apart from firefighting. That is precisely why Steve Hilton, David Cameron's policy chief, left Downing Street, because he concluded he actually couldn't achieve much there. And many other number 10 aides have buggered off because they realise that they can do more to change the world in a think tank. And all the while, as a, as a politician who may or may not be making any news, you just take a load of shit. You're lambasted and lampooned. Your every shortcoming, weakness and failure is exposed, picked over, dwelt upon and exaggerated. No mistake is forgiven or forgotten. You're rarely praised or celebrated. You get almost no sleep. You can't really be seen having any fun. I mean, look what happened when David Cameron went to Ibiza, got picked apart for that. You can't freely choose what schools your children go to. You have to be very careful about who you hang out with. You lose old friends and you can't be seen with certain people. And it's even worse, of course, if you're a woman, whether you're a politician making news or any other woman in the news, no wardrobe slip up, no bad hair day, no change of shape or size goes unremarked upon. Your outfits are ridiculed, your voice is ridiculed, you are patronised and mocked. And at the end of it all, what happens? Well, you go from being a rising star to embattled to finally sacked. You either lose an election or you resign. All political careers end in failure. By contrast, journalists, whilst certainly I have to admit are responsible for some of that misery, we have all the power, sometimes far more, and none of the responsibility. And more importantly, and here's a serious bit, we do get things done. Now I know it's fashionable to kick journalists and journalism these days. We are the scumbags that tap phones, stalk celebrities, and hound victims of crime. And I expect Michael, after me, will give a really compelling account of the rough time that he's had at the hands of scurrilous sections of the press. A lot of it very historic, I may say. But I don't think that that is a powerful argument for why it's better to be a newsmaker than it is to report it. It is, in the end, just an individual tale of woe. 
I'd also like to challenge Ben's contention that we're all going down the pan because nobody reads papers anymore or you can get your news free on the internet or the TV. Campaigning newspapers like the Sunday Times and the Daily Mail are actually making money. That may come as a surprise to some of you. And more importantly, we are changing things. Look at the Sunday Times expose of lobbying this weekend. For two years, the government has fannied around doing absolutely nothing about the lobbying industry. They promised in the coalition agreement that there would be a register of lobbyists. They didn't bother delivering it. One embarrassing front page and a bit of undercover filming from the Sunday Times and hey presto, the lobbying register is on its way. So without journalism, MPs would still be claiming Jaffa cakes, duck houses and moat cleaning services on their expenses. And Chris Hune, a lying, cheating rat, would still be a powerful member of the cabinet, possibly even Deputy Prime Minister. Exposing his lies, albeit about a relatively minor initial offence, was one of the most extraordinary, exciting and difficult episodes of my career. Some aspects of the process were very painful, but in the end, that's what journalists do. We get to the truth. We expose lies, and it's for others to decide what happens next. So yes, given a big platform, balls of steel and writing talent, as a journalist, you can change the world. Look at my late colleague, Mari Colvin, the war reporter killed on the front line in Syria. She probably did more than any other single individual to draw global attention to that hellish conflict. No amount of politicians pontificating matched the power of her dispatches, filled as they were with the raw agony of real people. It's a form of public service, but it's also a lot of fun. I work at Westminster where I'm free to roam. I spend my days gossiping with politicians and I hear all sorts of incredibly interesting things and it's wonderful being on the inside of all that. As a serious journalist, you can have breakfast, lunch or dinner with almost anyone. You're tied to nobody but your boss and your readers, meaning you're free to criticise as and where you choose. And unlike politicians, you have the luxury of being able to sound off about what newsmakers are doing wrong without being obliged to come up with any great solutions. And if after all of this, you're still crazy enough to think life might be better as a politician, guess what? You've made so many friends in high places that you can cut out all the crap and get parachuted into a safe seat. In the end, it's a strange motion. The most worthwhile work is rarely newsworthy. The unsung heroes saving lives in operating theatres or science labs, working in war or disaster zones, they don't make headlines. But if you have to choose between making news and reporting it, I urge you not to fall for the empty charms of being a newsmaker, a temporary headline grabber, here today, gone tomorrow, to invisibility, ageing, failure, prison or rehab. Thank you.